Hello? Hello, family. That was really weak from everyone but Joe. I appreciate it. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Get started. We're a little bit behind tonight, but we should be online now. Um, we just have a couple announcements tonight. I think the first one up is our beach retreat sign up. Yes. Okay, so we have our beach retreat coming up. Um, our theme, if you weren't here Wednesday night, um, we're going to be studying Yahweh, which is the name of God uh, most used in the Old Testament. And so we're going to take a look at this name of God um, and what it means. And so we're going to be, be diving deep into that. And we hope you can do that. Um, so if you're a high school student and you aren't signed up yet, uh, make sure you text Philip or I or you text the Remind or Facebook or 12 different ways. Just let us know that you want to go um, and we'll get you signed up for that. Um, next up on the list, we have our new series on Wednesday nights. Um, so if you haven't been here yet, we're doing the gospel. Um, and what this is is a series from EU. Um, normally we get to go down um, to this conference and we get to go to all these classes. And this year they put together um, kind of a five-class series that we're going to be doing over the next month or so. Somebody at school or at work or a neighbor or maybe somebody you hadn't quite figured out who you're going to give it to yet. That's okay. We just want you to be praying about that. And uh, we look forward to that in about, about four more weeks. Uh, we'll get ready to do that together. So continue to pray and continue to think about who you can reach. Thanks. All right. And I think last up on our slider is kind of our, our weekly news. Um, just remember in your prayers this week, um, Daryl Duke, he's still struggling with a little bit of health issues. Um, and then Judy Larkin, um, and that is Larkin's grandmother, if I'm not wrong. And she's having surgery um, this Wednesday. Is that right? Okay, this Wednesday. Uh, so remember her and her in your prayers this week. Um, and then um, don't forget about our couple birthdays this week, um, Nathan and Sam. Um, we're going to go to prayer, and then we're going to be dismissed to classes. And I'll pass this off to Will. Um, and then after Will is done, you guys can go to your classes. If you don't know where your class is, come see me or Philip. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for letting us be able to come here tonight and to uh, spend time together um, as your children um, to dig deeper into your word and to uh, learn more about you and your son. Um, please bless us to return to our home safely tonight. And um, thank you for everything you bless us with. And just share and pray. Amen.
Hello, family. Hello. Hello. Go, Felipe. I am glad to see you guys. How's everybody doing? Good. Tell me something good from your week. That's how we'll get started this afternoon. He's got some good news to share with us as we kick things off. Anybody? Hey. Hey, that's great. Where's the studio? Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Congratulations. Good job. So when do you start? All right. Thanks so much. Cool. All right. What else is good? Exciting times, huh? Yes. Beach is coming up. The beach retreat is coming up. Yeah. Woo! Oh, beach retreat is coming up. Hey, before I'll get to y'all just a minute, but I want to say something about the beach retreat. Um, we have a really good number signed up. Uh, I feel sometimes I, I mention this just to mention this because different events and stuff. Uh, the beach retreats price has gone up a little bit. If, if anybody in this room is like, oh, I want to go, but money's it's, it's tight, please, please, please let me know. It'll stay between us, and uh, we'll cover your way. Like, we, we don't ever want you to miss an activity or an event because money was an issue, okay? So I say that, I, I'm not saying that to anybody. I'm saying that to everybody, you know what I'm saying? Like, not just one or two people. I really mean that. So uh, please, please let me know. Uh, again, we don't want money to ever stop anybody from attending an event. Uh, and we have people who give all the time uh, so that you guys can do things like that. So the money's there. Don't let that stand away. Cool? All right, I saw a couple other hands. What else is good? Daniel. Interns have been announced. Michael. <laughs> Say it again. Interns have been announced. The interns were announced. Yay! <laughs> depending, on, depending on how you feel about that, I'm excited. Yeah, CC. Well, you know, we've still got to, still got to work on her. But the rest of them. No, that's that's really exciting. And uh, anyway, now you know. How many of you are totally surprised? No. Really? Okay. Well, I, I'm glad we didn't surprise you. And then Daniel. Uh, well, I am. I got to go see my cousins for their birthday. Hey, um, oh man, Lindsay, can I can I get you to help me with something? And maybe Karis, can you help her too? Yeah. I need everybody to get a pen and paper. All right, pen and paper. And I'm just my bad. I should have told you before just now. But everybody needs a pen and paper because we're gonna do something really fun. All right, pen and paper. Y'all got it? Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. While they're getting that ready. Um, Let's review a couple of things. You know, last week we started a new series that we're calling Out of the Shadows. I think that's the next slide. There it is. And uh, we talked about how the Old Testament was uh, almost like a shadow of, of the good things to come in Christ, the good things uh, in the New Testament. And so last week we kicked that series off. You go to the next slide. Uh, we talked about the two Testaments. We, we looked at that question. Why are there two Testaments? Why is there an Old Testament and a New Testament? Who remembers something about that from last week? Why are there two testaments? Daniel? Uh, one of the testaments is to tell us about why we need to not like prepare us for the next one. Okay, it's yeah, yeah. Like, but, and it's also just to warn us what not to do. Okay, yeah. Do you remember the passage we looked at out of Hebrews? And by, all, by the way, all of these lessons are coming out of Hebrews. But remember the passage we looked at where it said the law was a tutor? To lead us to Christ, and we, we giggled at the word tutor. But also, we talked about how that's the job of a tutor is to lead you to where you need to be. And that was the role of the Old Testament was to take us to Christ. Uh, and then it even says we're not under a tutor anymore. Now that the law has come, the law of Christ has come. We don't need the tutor in the same way. All right. Another word for testament is will. Will. All right, good. Good job. All right. Another word for will and testament. Another word we looked at was that word covenant. I want you to look at this next passage out of the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 9, verses 16 through 17, uh, think, can we read for you? Everybody listen as the word of God is read this. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not enforced as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant of the king, 
and also be able to help you. Very good. Again, this idea of a testament and a will. A will goes into effect after a person's died. So when does the will of Christ go into effect? When he died on the cross. So now we are under his will. The New Testament, the will of Christ. Alright, the next slide says something that's really important. The better we understand the Old Testament, the better we understand Christ, our need for him. The writings of the Old Testament and how they were calling us... Uh, calling for a Messiah, the one who was to come, the anointed one. And Christ was the fulfillment of all of those prophecies in the Old Testament. So here's what we're going to do next. Does everybody have, we're getting really close. I'm sorry, you girls are doing great. Thank you for doing that. Pen and paper. Do we have pens and paper? Here's what I want you to do. All right, thank you so much. Who still needs a pen and paper? A whole row. Oh, we're so close. All right. Hey. The rest of you, while we're waiting, everybody go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to be there in just a minute. But as you're turning to Hebrews 1, I want you to go in there and then we'll do this little activity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karis. I appreciate the help. Hebrews chapter 1. Did everybody get their utensils? What you need? All right. Here we go. Utensils and supplies. Here we go. All right. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to uh, I'm going to describe uh, a a creature. Creature. I'm going to describe a creature, and I want you to see if you can accurately draw a picture of the creature I described. Okay. So I'm going to again I'm going to describe a creature to you, and if your picture is closest to the creature that I described, you win. Okay. Uh, you win 20 Yeti bucks. How's that? That's, oh, yeah! That's, that's good. That's good. It makes your beach retreat a little cheaper, right? So here we go. I have eight facts about the creature. Are you ready? Here we go. Get ready to sketch. I look forward to seeing your interpretation of the creature. Here we go. Number one, the creature has a narrow head. The creature has a narrow head. Alright. Ready for the next clue? The creature has two eyes. It really narrows it down. All right. The creature has two large feet. Ready? The creature has two arms with claws on the end. Okay. Go too fast. Slow it, slow it down a little. The creature is often hunched over. Alright. You ready for the next clue of the creature? The creature has a long tail. Number seven, the creature has long, pointy ears. Is your picture looking really weird? <laughs> and finally, the creature has brown fur. But excuse me. I know you can't. Right. Come with that. But just, it's going to have fur, is what I'm trying to tell you. All right. Is this like a goblin or something? Easy peasy. So, Kyle thinks he's got a great picture. No, I got one better. All right. Who thinks they have the most accurate picture of the creature? Let's see what you have. Should I tell you what the creature is? Yes. Oh, that's a good guess. Wait, what did you say? That's a very good guess. He guessed an anteater. That is a very good guess. Very good guess. Anybody else want to guess what it is? What are you guys doing? A cat, that's a good guess. That's an incorrect guess, but it's a good guess. A caveman. A caveman. No? Alright, let me see. I think I did pretty good. That's good. I think I was there. What do we got? Alright, here, here it is. Karis, you got a guess again? Kangaroo. 
The creature is a kangaroo. Pretty much or pretty close, an ancestor to the kangaroo. Hold your hand up, and I want to. We're going to have like a little bit of a voting thing here. Let me see. Some, some beings that really we don't have a lot of reference point for, okay? So with that thought in mind, let's take a look at a message from Bible Flanagraph Man as we get ready to talk about it. Go ahead. It's your boy, Bible Phanagraph Man, here to help biblical concepts stick. Today's question comes from Michael, age 16. He writes, Dear Bible Phanagraph Man, I need some relationship advice. Oh goody, no one ever asked me for relationship advice. Yesterday I told my girlfriend that she was an angel and all of a sudden she got super offended. Why? Hmm. I guess my first piece of relationship advice would be for you to stop talking to me about your problems and go talk to your girlfriend about them. Perhaps there's a reason no one ever comes to me for relationship advice. When you called your girlfriend an angel, you probably meant it in a complimentary sense, like in the way that our society commonly thinks of angels. We even sing songs about them, you know, like, Shorty, you my angel, kiss an angel, good morning. That was a Really popular song when I had your great, 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 great grandfather in vacation Bible school. Or songs like In the Arms of an Angel. By the way, every time I hear that song, I feel the need to adopt a dog. I've heard the song 43 times in my life, and I've adopted 43 stray dogs. Coincidence? I think not. Anyway, where was I? Ah, yes, angels. When you refer to your girlfriend as an angel, it was as if to say, I like you and I should like to court you very much. However, she must have been thinking about angels in a biblical sense. Sounds like you're dating the keeper there, Michael. Don't mess it up. Angels in the Bible weren't admired for their beauty. In fact, it was quite the opposite. 
The angels we read about in God's word were often terrified in their appearance. Many times when an angel of the Lord appears in God's word, the immediate response of the human being is fear. It happened to Gideon, Cornelius, Zechariah, and Mary to name a few. It's no wonder that the first words out of an angel's mouth are commonly, Fear not, or do not be afraid. Another thing that people seemed to do in their fearful state was fall down and worship angels. But whenever that occurred, the angels were quick to correct it. They refused to be worshipped, understanding that God alone was the one who was meant to be praised. And so, yes, if I was your girlfriend, I too would be offended, not only because you're a cheapskate with commitment issues, but more so because you are insinuating that the sheer sight of her terrifies you. Oh, and one more thing, Michael, just between us. Ashley said that Jenna told her the real reason Brooke said your girlfriend Mackenzie was so upset with you is because you forgot Lindsay's birthday. Well, until next time, this is Bible Flattergraph Man saying, in the arms of the angel, fly away from here. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go take in another rescue dog. So, in the Hebrew, the which is the language of the Old Testament, and also in the Greek, the language of the New Testament, the word for angel means messenger. Okay? So anytime in God's word we see that word angel, really remember it's a messenger. It's one of the messengers of God. And so... Um, that, they're not your normal messengers, though, because when people saw them, like the Bible Flanagraph man was telling us, a lot of times people responded in fear. Um, when Daniel saw the angel Gabriel in Daniel chapter 8, uh, he fell on his face before Gabriel out of fright. I think that's on the next slide. Maybe. Yeah, he fell down uh, because he was afraid. He fell on his face, it says. Um, in Luke chapter 1, Gabriel gives a message to both Zechariah and Mary, and when Zechariah uh, saw him, he was so afraid, I think it's on the next slide, sorry, you gotta go to the next one, yeah. Uh, when he saw uh, the angel, uh, he fear fell upon him, and we also read that Mary was greatly troubled uh, when Gabriel appeared and gave her that message. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, on the next one, when Cornelius sends an angel, uh, when, when he sees an angel, uh, he stares at him in terror, like he can't even move or talk, so he's just staring at the angel. Uh, and so this is kind of cool too. In God's Word, we see like three different kinds of angels in the Bible. And so I want to tell you about some of those different kinds of angels. The first word that we see, uh, well, angels in the outfield, that's the fourth kind, and they're not in the Bible. But the first kind I want to tell you about are the cherubim. If you'll take your Bibles and uh, like go ahead and like mark Hebrews chapter 1 if you've got a literal Bible that you can hold like this. Mark chapter 1 of Hebrews. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But we're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 1 where um, Ezekiel describes something that he sees uh, when he describes who the cherubim are. And so check this out. Um, someone want to read for me? Can I get somebody to read? That's okay. I'll do it. I'll read a little bit and uh, maybe get somebody else to do that. So here we go. Ezekiel 1 starting in verse 5. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands, and the four had their, face, had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another, each one of them went straight forward without turning as it went, as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, uh, while two covered their bodies, and we each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and no, I'm sorry, go back. And out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. So he's describing uh, something that would be really overwhelming to see. Um, in Genesis chapter 3, we read about uh, the cherubim and their job there. Can I get somebody to read? Uh, Ellie, will you take the screen for me? He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and 
flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, so what's the job of the cherubim here? Like a guardian. Yeah, like, like a guardian. You know, we think like guardian angel, like, oh, it's going to protect me. And this is like a don't cross me kind of angel. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't even think about going into Eden again. And so there's this angel with a uh, flame, like a flaming sword. Uh, so don't want to mess with that guy. Uh, let's keep going. Oh, and also, there's several times in the scripture where God is described as being on his throne between the cherubim. And so they seem like they are surrounding God's throne. All right? The second group of angels that we're, we talk about or that we see in God's word are the seraphim. The seraphim. And this is, um, that, that's a really cool picture. Uh, there's a lot of kind of cool art of some of what these angels might look like. And I thought I'd share a couple of pictures with you guys. Uh, but there's the seraphim. And I say in chapter 6, we read about them. And you're going to see kind of similar language than what we just saw uh, in Ezekiel. But uh, Addison, will you take that for us? In the year that the king Judea died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and a train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Uh, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Alright, so what what is Isaiah uh, what what's going through his mind as he's taking all this in? He sees, he sees these creatures, he sees the seraphim, and these winged creatures, and two of them covering his face. Uh, and what are, the, what are the seraphim calling out? Did you catch that? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. And by the way, we, we sing the song, uh, holy, 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 and that's based on the song of the seraphim. I don't know if they're singing it or if they're saying it, but at either rate, uh, that's where that comes from. And so here they are calling out to, to God about how holy that he is. And Isaiah's taking all of this in. And what's his reaction? He's overwhelmed. Why? How are you blind when you can't see? <laughs> okay. No, not exactly. But I like your answer. He said, how are they blind when they can't see? He's really overwhelmed at the fact that he's in this holy presence of a holy God. And... What about Isaiah? Is he holy? No. He doesn't see himself worthy to even be in this place and be, behold the scene that he's getting to take in. And so he's like, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And if we keep reading in the story, uh, he says, God says, uh, who, who can I go? Who, who can I send? And do you remember what Isaiah says? If you keep reading in that story, one of the seraphim, I believe, takes a burning coal and touches his mouth with it, and he says, now you're clean. And he says, here am I, send me. I'll go. I'll go tell people who God is. Pretty cool. I'll be your messenger, God. Um, by the way, I'll be your angel, God. You could say it that way, because what's an angel? I'll be your messenger, God. And so that's what Isaiah, uh, how he reacts to seeing that scene. All right, the third group of angels that we read about are the archangels. The archangels. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, I think it's... Oh, but let's go back, because that's a really cool picture. Yeah, there's a scene out of Revelation, and I think, I think this is on the screen in just a minute, uh, where it describes, it names one of the archangels named Michael. And, uh, and Michael uh, is, is depicted in this scene in Revelation chapter 12, where he fights against this great snake, this great dragon. And so uh, you'll get to see that in a little bit. Here we go. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a, with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So what's the archangel doing in this passage? When God comes back, when Jesus comes back, what's the archangel going to do? Sound the trumpet? Make a loud cry? A loud call? And, uh, and then... Come back. All right. Do what? Yeah. Yeah. These are dudes you don't want to mess with. All right. 
Um, in Revelation 12, this is the scene that's depicted with it, with uh, Michael. Um, Trinity, will you read the screen for us? Yeah. Now war rose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for him, for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the seer of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down over him. Alright, so very good. Okay, so angels are, are cool to study, but when we get to the book of Hebrews, go ahead and turn back to the book of Hebrews. Angels are cool to study, but when we get to the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, by the way, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but the author of Hebrews wants people to know very, very clearly that Jesus is superior to angels. That they make no mistake, angels are amazing. They're powerful messengers of God. They are powerful, powerful beings, but they are nowhere in the same ballpark as Christ. And that's what the book of Hebrews opens up with. Hebrews chapter 1, if you were going to like say, okay, Hebrews 1 is about this, Hebrews 2 is about this, the whole book of Hebrews overall is about how the Old Testament is supposed to lead us to Christ. That's why we're studying this uh, for a class series. But Hebrews chapter 1 specifically is about how Jesus is superior even to the angels, okay? So if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Hebrews chapter 1, and, uh, and we'll read that here uh, right now. Let's do it. Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And, man, who do I want to call on? Um, Jacob, will you read? Do you mind reading the screen? Can you see it from there? Okay, go. If you don't mind, take that. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our prophets by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, who He appointed their heir of all things, who is in the house of the creator of the He is the greatest of the glory of God in the exact universe by the word of his power. After making his questions, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much fear to angels as the name he has inherited more faith in the universe. Very good. Okay, so did you catch that verse 4? Jesus' name is even more superior uh, to the angels. So, Anyway, you're going to see in the book of Hebrews, especially chapter 1, Jesus is greater than the angels. Now let's talk a little bit about this passage. When it, This is like the opening sentence in this letter. Um, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. First, let's talk about that many times and many ways. What are some ways that you guys remember that God communicated with people in the Old Testament? What are some ways that He communicated with people in the Old Testament? In a different way than he does now, right? What are some of the ways that he used to do it? Yeah. Through fire. Through fire. Okay, can you give me an example of the time when that happened? Whenever the, um, whenever the Israelites were traveling through the desert. Yeah, that's a great example. Remember, they were led by the, the cloudy pillar by day, and at night, it turned into a fiery cloud. And so God led them, like almost like having a torch, right? And he led them through the wilderness uh, wherever he wanted them to go. And so they'd pick up camp and they'd follow after the cloud. Yeah, what else? There's like a, a sort of a, like a temple. Okay. Like, and one the top, that's where you have the veil. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, and in fact, he, almost like talking face to face, we're told that yeah. they spoke to one another as if he was speaking to a friend. Yeah. And Moses would wear a veil over his face because when he would be in the presence of God, uh, it makes me think of like X-Men or something, but his, his skin would radiate. And it scared the people back at camp. So he came back and he started wearing a veil to cover his face because I guess people, it was just, maybe he couldn't have conversation with anybody. They were too afraid of him. Okay, so he starts wearing a veil to, to hopefully maybe not cause them as much, much fear. All right, so sometimes God would speak to him directly, right? Like he spoke to Moses, just, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. All right, how else? You said through fire. What's another example of God communicating with fire? Remember? Burning bush. Burning bush. When God first meets, or when Moses first meets God, right? And uh, he communicates this burning bush that it's on fire, but it's not burning up. And Moses is like, what? What's going on? Okay. How else did God communicate in the Old Testament? Yeah, Seth? Through the prophets. Through the prophets. Yeah, that's exactly what it says up here on the screen, right? He communicated through the prophets. Who are some of the prophets that God spoke through? Jonah. Jonah. Elijah. 
Elijah. A rainbow. Oh, another way. <laughs> we'll go back to the other question. Yeah, he did. He communicated with the rainbow, right? He said, that's my sign. That's my covenant. That's my promise that I'm not going to destroy the earth again with water, right? Well, that's how he communicated. Yes, and he communicated that promise. You're right. You're exactly right. I'm with you. But also, we were talking about prophets. And so, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Daniel, Hosea. Can we just keep going? You know any others? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these guys, right? And so, in, now how about this? He communicated with Solomon how? Through dream. Through dream. He communicated to Balaam how? Do you remember the story of Balaam? Somebody said it. God opens the mouth of a donkey and the donkey starts speaking to Balaam. Wow. That would freak you out, right? So God, in Hebrews, it starts that way. In Hebrews it says, in many, at, at old times, in many times, in various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, through the fathers, like Abraham, Moses, um, on and on and on. All those Old Testament characters, Joseph, Jacob, all those. Uh, but he says, in these last days he's spoken to us through his son. Now before we get to that, let's think about it. You, Seth, you mentioned he spoke to people through the prophets. But also, as we've been talking about in this class specifically, he's communicated some powerful things through angels, through his messengers that we call angels. So here are some things that, yeah, again, Jesus is greater than angels. Go back to that last slide, if you would, Cal. Look at some of the things that we see angels doing, uh, some really important messages that, that God sent through the angels. Um, Ethan, who I just saw smiling at me. Read, uh, if you would, read the first bullet up there, that warning and rescue. Born and rescue brought from Solomon. Um, Very good. So God sent those angels on a rescue mission, right? They go to Sodom and Gomorrah and they get the family out of there. They get Lot's family out of there in Genesis 19. Uh, Taylor, will you take the next one? Gabriel sent to Daniel to give him a message about his Yeah, he sent to Daniel to give him a message about his people. Uh, how about Preston? Will you take the next one that sent to celebrate? Um, sent to celebrate his birth. Yeah, remember the angels showed up in that scene? And they're, they're signifying the, the arrival of the Messiah, that Jesus has come to the earth, the Savior's born. How about uh, the next one? Um, how about Nathan? Will you take it? Ministered to Jesus in Gethsemane and in the wilderness after the Jesus temple. All right, what's happening in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember? Jesus, what's he doing there? He's praying in the Garden. He's praying so hard that his, his sweat became like great drops of blood. Are y'all with me? And angels, we see angels arriving in that scene. And what about in the wilderness? What's happened there? He's tempted by the devil. And at the end of that scene, we see that angels show up again and minister to Christ. Um, how about the next one? When we, when we go to the empty tomb, who's there to tell the ladies at the tomb uh, what's happened? It's angels. Right? He's not here, for He is risen. Alright, then the next one. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, if you guys were here Wednesday, remember the lesson? Uh, my friend Boo, who spoke, um, he talked about, what a great name. Um, he talked about how the angel in Acts chapter 1 was like, hey, why are you guys standing here? Why are you just gazing up into heaven? Jesus said, it's time to get to work, right? And so um, they even said, Jesus will come in the same way you saw in the sin. He'll come back and he'll descend one day. All right, let's keep moving. So again, Jesus is greater than the angels. Um, why? Why? Why is Jesus greater than the angels? There's a few reasons why. Number one, oh, were you going to tell me a reason? Okay, he's the Son of God. Yeah, a very good reason. Number one on the screen is that angels are not eternal. Angels are not eternal. Look at this verse. This is pretty cool. Maybe you've never thought about it. Like, angels are not eternal. Well, okay. They, so they haven't always been in heaven. Look at Psalm 148. This is kind of an interesting verse. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. Praise Him sun and moon. Praise Him all you shining stars. Praise Him you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Watch this. Let them praise the name of the Lord. I forgot the letter A in that. But praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded and they were what? Created. So here verse 5, linking all these things together. God commanded it and it happened. They were created. So who's created? Angels were created. Um, what about Jesus, though? He's eternal. Not angels. 
Jesus is eternal. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we learn about who's, who is this Word that it's talking about. If you keep reading in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, and we have seen His glory, glory as of only the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was a part of that scene all throughout eternity. All right, let's keep moving. Why else is Jesus greater than the angels? Number two, because angels do not have authority. Angels do not have authority. You know what that word authority means? Like they get to make the rules. They get to call the shots. Do what? They don't get to make the decisions. That's right. They don't get to make those decisions. You're right. Um, they understand very, very clearly who they work for. How about this? In Matthew 28, now, that's what the angels, the angels recognize their authority. But what about Jesus? Did Jesus claim to be authority? Uh, Scott, read for us what's on the screen here. What's Jesus say? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. Jesus was very, very clear about the authority that he had. He says, I I've got all authority on heaven and on earth. All right, what about the next one? Why else is Jesus greater than the angels? Angels do not accept worship. As our friend Bible Flanagram said, Flanagram Man said, um, a lot of times when they would start to worship an angel, the angel's like, get up, what are you doing? I'm just a man. And, um, but that's not how Jesus was. Uh, in Revelation 22, verse 9, uh, John starts to worship an angel. And look what the angel says. Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of the book. Worship God, but worship me. What about Jesus? What does he say? Well, if you read in the next passage in Matthew 14, um, this, this isn't even at the time Jesus has raised from the dead. But remember, uh, the apostles are scared in the boat. There's the storm, and Jesus just calms the storm. And then after Jesus calms the storm, we read this. Those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. But we see Jesus stop them and say, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't worship me. Worship God. What does he do? He allows them to worship because he is God. He understands that worship is totally acceptable and good. So, um, all right. We're all, like out of time, but I'm going to run through these real fast, okay? Um, why does this matter? So what? Why does this whole lesson matter? I want to tell you two reasons why this matters. Number one, Jesus is the ruler of the world. He's the ruler of this world. Have you, uh, have you ever met somebody really famous? Or have you ever like tweeted to somebody and they responded to it? Oh, I want to hear, let me hear at least a couple of these. Who's somebody that you've either met or somebody that you've interacted with and you thought, oh man, this, this is the greatest thing ever. Yes, sir. Uh, I had an ice bath with LeBron Kidd. <laughs> okay. Who? LeBron James. You <laughs> met LeBron James Kidd. Yes. Tell us about that. How was <laughs> that? So, uh, first tournament of last year was in Alabama. And it's a huge tournament. It was after my year, it was after his week, he walks in, and it was just a normal conversation. Wow. Cool. That is cool. That is cool. Okay. Are we going to play like the one up game? Okay, who can top that right now? It's pretty cool. What do you got? <laughs> Not saying it tops so it, just saying what do you got? Yeah. yeah. I met Kelly Clarkson. Like, I mean, she was in there. I mean, she's as chill as she is. Like, as you would think she is. She'd give you the shirt off her back. I'm like, nice cool. Super nice cool. Yeah. So, Kelly Clarkson, LeBron's kid. Um, if you've ever like tweeted at somebody like a celebrity and they responded or they retweeted it, and you're like, look, look, <laughs> show your friends, um, or they like something you did on Instagram or how, whatever. Um, it's 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 this feeling of like, whoa, they're like super important and look how much look they care about, it. look what they did, and and that's just a that's just a stupid example. That's like a, a really small example. But guys, think about this. Think about how incredible this is. The ruler of the world cares about you. The ruler of this world cares about you. Wow. That's amazing. The next reason why all this should matter to us is that... Go to the next one. Um, the next one. There it is. That Jesus is the author of our salvation. Jesus is the author of our salvation. 
I want you to look at this passage and we'll wrap up, okay? This is from um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. And uh, there's a word that you're not going to see in the English, but I want to talk about it uh, as it appears in the Greek in just a minute. It says, For it was fitting for him, for whom, for whom all things are, are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. That word, that idea of an author. You know, when we think about an author, maybe you think about somebody sitting at a computer, like typing a book, or like writing something with pen or a quill or whatever, but really that idea, it, that word author in Greek is this, this idea of a pioneer, all right? What's a, a pioneer? Picture somebody like a, a coonskin cow. But what is, a, what is the job of a pioneer? Oh, it's, it's this person who, who goes before us, all right? It's almost like this idea of a champion, uh, someone who's won a victory. And so think about this. This is really important because we can know that we're not the only people trying to navigate life. Sometimes we feel like we're the only ones struggling or that no one really knows what we're facing. How cool is it that Jesus is the pioneer who's gone before us? Like an expedition leader. This is awesome. Like an expedition leader cuts away through jungle growth for the rest of the expedition, Jesus carved out the way we should live on this earth. And it is preserved for us in Scripture. Isn't that beautiful? He is the one who's gone before us and he's blazed a trail so that we can go to heaven. Jesus is superior than the angels. He's the greatest thing to ever come to this earth. Let's pray together and we'll wrap up. Father in heaven, thank you so much for sending your son. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your mercy on us. Thank you that uh, even though you are high and holy, uh, like Isaiah was able to see, you still care for us. Uh, the ruler of this world died for us. Lord, we want to meet you one day. Help us to live the right way so that we can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.